All right, welcome to CS uh, 4510. The topic of today is L15B. This is on NP. NP is a class. You probably have seen it before in 3510. You may not remember everything. NP does not stand for not polynomial. This stands for non-deterministic polynomial time. So. Um, recall that a non-deterministic Turing machine is one that looks like this. It's got like this weird thing like the NFA does. I read an A and I'm just going to do something wacky. I'm going to go to two different states. The transition function is what? Read a state, add some, excuse me, add some state, read a symbol. Um, transition to a, the power set of state symbol, uh, of state symbol uh, left-right pairs, right? Or triples, tuples. So you don't, the actions of the non-deterministic Turing machine are not determined. Uh, they are non-deterministic. So in some sense, the non we gave several analogies of this during the NFA lecture like uh, six weeks ago, a month ago, two months ago. Uh, the NFA like gets lucky. It just like knows what the answer is and it can allow it to do that kind of jump. And in fact, we think that the non-deterministic Turing machine, given the same non-deterministic power, can do a lot more than a deterministic Turing machine. We have no way to prove it, though, but we just think that's the case. NP is the class, if we let n time, uh, f of n, to be exactly what you think it is, the class of languages decidable by a non-deterministic Turing machine, which takes polynomial time. Now, it's non-deterministic polynomial time. The way a non-deterministic Turing machine measures time is different. It's not the same as a deterministic Turing machine, right? In some sense, because deterministic, term, deterministic computation is like one after the other, um, non-deterministic Turing machine is considered, the time is measured as the depth of all the branches it takes. So there's a polynomial bound on the depth of the computation that it takes. And each branch can do a lot of work by itself, a lot of polynomials, right? We think that the non-deterministic Turing machine has like an exponential advantage in some sense. We will define NP as not not polynomial, but non-deterministic polynomial time to be the union of k is equal to 0 to infinity of n time uh, f n to the k. So a language is an NP if there exists a non-deterministic Turing machine, which takes polynomial time to decide the language. This is the non-determinism, again, the same non-determinism from the NFA. You've probably heard of NP, though, from a different context. You've probably heard of a different definition of NP. What is another definition of NP you may have heard? It's like verifiable in polynomial time. For now, I'm going to call that NPV, just, and we'll prove they're equivalent. NPV, we'll say L is an NPV if uh, W is an L, if and only if there exists a witness X. And we'll call, we'll say X is of size, I don't know, polynomial. So, Uh, such that the v, uh, v on input W and X accepts in poly time. Okay, there's a lot of stuff going on here. Let's, let's take a second. W is an L. If it only exists, if it only if, there exists a polynomial sized witness. A witness is a helper string. It's an answer. V is what's called a deterministic poly time verifier. It takes as input a word and this witness or a certificate. It's a certification. And the witness basically just checks the answer. This is a verifier. It's not a solver. You should think of it like an auto grader. It doesn't have to find out what the answer is. It, all it has to do is just check if the answer is right. In practice, W, excuse me, X is going to be the, maybe I shouldn't use W for word and X for witness. Maybe I'll call this C. Call the C for certificate. C is the answer, and V is an auto grader, and V simply just checks if that's the right answer. It has a much easier job. Um, NPV is this class of deterministically poly time verifiable problems, right? You proved, you may recall proving SAT is in NP by giving a poly time verifier. The in, the, you de de decide on what the witness is, it's uh, the satisfying assignment, and then you plug and chug, something like this. Yes? W not L if there's not a certificate. Oh, great question. Um, I'm going to forget that part for now, because let's talk about co-NP later. We'll bring that around somewhere. 
Okay? Non-determinism, maybe I'll say a little bit about it now. Non-determinism is a biased power, right? What does the negation of this look like? W is not an L, if and only if you negate the whole thing. There does not exist a witness. For all witnesses, they bring the machine to reject. Um, Non-determinism, if the answer exists, is really easy at finding the answer for you. But if there is no answer, how do you certify that actually there's no solution? You can convince someone there is a solution by saying, here's a solution, just plug it in. Go check if it works. But if you say, I have no solution to this problem, there is no solution at all. How do you convince someone of that? That's harder. So complement of NP, difficult, as we'll see. Well, exactly, it's as difficult as NP, but it's different. It's orthogonal in general. Right. Um, questions on this definition from 3510? Well, earlier when you talked about end time, like the time is the depth of the computation. Do you mean like the depth of the shortest accepting computation? No, the longest accepting computation. But Actually, so on input a word, yeah, the shortest accepting computation. Okay. Yeah. And we'll also define like you can, uh, that all branches halt. Okay. Like you could create a weird non deterministic Turing machine where one computation branch infinitely loops. We would consider this machine not an acceptor, just conventionally. I see. Questions? Okay, so we've given two definitions of the same thing. I've called them slightly different things. How do you prove two sets are equal? Double set containment. Double set containment. Let's prove NP equals NPV. This actually may surprise you. Like, why, why should that even be true? I mean, NP is magical. It's got non-determinism. Crazy. This is just an auto grader. Why are those the same? Is this auto grading ability? Is this, you get this answer is this really as strong as non-determinism? Turns out it will be. Yeah. Can't you just run through the non-deterministic path that one that accepted the certificate? That'll end up being half the proof. But it's going to be a double set containment. So maybe we'll do that. We'll do that direction first. How about that? Personally, I still think this is like. Intuitive, but maybe impressive. Like, it's still interesting to, that this string, just having access to a polynomial-sized answer is as, is as powerful as all of non-determinism. I still think that's fascinating. Part of the end, reason is that the, you don't get to choose the witness. The witness is chosen for you. And if the witness is chosen to be the answer that you want for you, then congrats. You have a polynomial time algorithm. Um, let's prove first that if n, we'll prove NP is a subset of NPV, OK? We're going to prove if a language is in, in NP, it is also in NPV. What this means is like uh, if, uh, let's say, L is in NP, there is polytime uh, NTM N to decide L. Right? So this is, there's, if L is an NP, there's a polynomial time non-deterministic Turing machine that decides L. It correctly says yes, and it correctly says no, and everything, right? Um, but think about how this, like, machine works, okay? If it runs in polynomial time, it makes a polynomial amount of non-deterministic choices, right? N makes a polynomial amount. of non-deterministic choices. So there exists some C, a polynomial size string, which is an encoding of these choices. We give a deterministic polytime verif uh, poly verifier a V to uh, verify L. OK? So V on input uh, W, but also the witness or the certificate, we'll call it C. Basically, like I mentioned this before, we, we can't just take the non-deterministic Turing machine and try to simulate deterministically. We'll have an exponential blow up. That's bad. 
The non-determinism makes the simulation kind of bad because we have to do all this BFS nonsense, and that ends up being exponential in the depth. Um, but what we're going to do is just let our witness hope the witness is the answer to the non-determinism. Simulate uh, n on w deterministically. If faced, now this is going to be kind of wordy for an algorithm, if faced with non-deterministic choice, make decision with next bit of C. So if, um, if n accepts w, excuse me, if n accepts, uh, let's say if n decides l, l, then there exists c uh, to convince uh, v on input w and c to accept. So we see that uh, l is then an element of npv. So we know that NP is a subset of NPB. That's actually the harder direction. Question? So we're just sort of offloading the non-determinism non to choosing our C? Ah, so we have to be very careful how we word this. C is not chosen or anything like this. C is given to us by God. C is a answer and we have no idea how it got it. Okay, imagine you're writing an auto grader. You work for gradescope.com. You have no idea where students are coming up with these answers. It's not your job. It's your job simply to verify. You simply are going to say, this is ChatGPT. This is correct. This is incorrect. You, know, you don't have to worry about who is responsible for generating the answers. Your job is simply to determine if it's right or wrong. Um, now, it turns out that delegated power to who is responsible for generating the witness is exactly all of non-determinism. Crazy that's, that's what works out. But we don't generate C. We don't worry about C. We simply check C. Now, if someone were to take V and run it on the wrong answer, oh well. But if they run it on the right answer, we'll accept. We simply need to ensure that there exists a C that we'll accept on. So, DVD. Questions? Let's prove the reverse, which is the easier way. Um, so we want to prove that all computation which is deterministically verifiable can be decided in polynomial non-deterministic time. Determ oh, man. Yeah, there we go. Um, so let's begin. Let L be in NPV. Then there exists V and, and some C such that... Uh, W is an L if and only if uh, the, the, this existence of this C uh, B on uh, W C accepts. We give poly time NTM N to decide L. Okay. Uh, N on input w. What are we going to do? Notice first off, we're giving a non-deterministic Turing machine. We need that non-determinism. If we don't have that non-determinism, we might accidentally prove that it's a subset of p. So we probably shouldn't be able to make a deterministic algorithm. We need the non-determinism here. How what are we going to do the non-determinism? Simulate a bunch of like non-deterministically generate every witness and then verify if that witness is correct. Or like Every witness? Time, polynomial length witnesses. It, basically, I'm um, to use a slightly, almost the same wording, uh, non-deterministically mm -hmm. 
guess the answer. Guess a polynomial sized answer. Oh, what's the answer? Well, let me guess. OK, I got it right. Non-determinism. Um, return v on w uh, c. Here by return, I really mean like simulate the verifier on the certificate and the w, and then accept it if it accepts, and reject it if it rejects. Okay, QED. Non-determinism. So when you program a non-determinist Turing machine, you'd be more careful about how this works, right? Um, if v is a verifier, it runs a polynomial time. It only has time to read a polynomial amount of information. So the verifier, the witness, excuse me, must be polynomial sized. The certificate has to be polynomial sized. So great thing is it's a polynomial sized certificate. Our non-determinist Turing machine has a polynomial time bound. We just guess non-deterministically in polynomial time each bit of the certificate, plug that into the verifier, and we got, we'll accept if it accepts. So you take the auto grader, you use non-determinism to determine, to guess the answer, and just check if your answer is right or not. That is the power of non-determinism. Yes? What if the certificate will be polynomial, but how do we like, know when to stop? It's like non-deterministically non guessing, I guess. Ah, uh, non-deterministically. I'm going to, oh, I'm writing, I'm non-deterministically writing down bits. Oh, I'm just going to non-deterministically guess to stop writing down bits. Um, there's an interesting question we can get to later is like, can you use non-determinism to guess future non-deterministic queries you'll make or something like this? The answer is it actually doesn't matter. We have a very great understanding of non-determinism in its power. Question? How can we restrict the size of the witness to be polynomial length? Or is what you're saying that we don't need to because if we were to construct a C that is larger than polynomial, then the verifier only uses the polynomial amount of the information, and so there must have already existed something that we computed quicker in polynomial time that was a shorter accepting computation path, and that was a computation path that we used to define the thing as polynomial in the first place. The polynomial restriction on a witness for the definition of NP is actually very important because you can construct languages that do have witnesses for them, but the shortest witness is very long. It's an exponential time. We want a problem to be an NP if it's efficiently verifiable. So like the answer is a short answer. Like you can quickly tell, quickly as in polynomial time, quickly tell if it's, it's right or wrong. Yeah. Now, here's a bad way to do like, if you had no restriction of this, here's a way to decide every language in NP, which is why it's not a good answer. The witness is simply the computation history of every single machine on an input. So you could verify an exponential time language in NP or something like this, right? You could just check if it's the right computation. If something like this works, you could just put the whole decidable languages in NP if you didn't have this restric restriction. But like, if V of W and C accepts in polynomial time with respect to the length of W, yeah. then is your restriction on the witness length necessary anymore? We want to ensure that N runs in polynomial time. So we'll just make sure the steps it takes run in polynomial time. So we'll make sure it only takes polynomial time to guess a witness, and each bit of the witness takes one non-deterministic step to guess. I guess what I'm saying is if you assume that V runs in polynomial time with respect to the length of W, then is that sufficient? Like from that, can you then derive that there must exist a polynomial time witness? Because V only uses a polynomial yes. time. Oh, no, no, no. Um, did I not well. write it down? O of n to the k is the time V takes. Yeah. But like we're not actually manually enforcing that C, that we terminate our construction, or like our non-deterministic generation of C before it has reached some sort of like hugely exponential time. We know C exists, and we know C is of this size, so we can simply, in polynomial time, guess it. Yeah. But we're utilizing the fact that we can check such a C in polynomial time. We check? You mean the second step, the return V, W, C? Yeah. Um, so the, separate the two steps. V exists. C exists. So guess it. That can be done in polynomial time. The simulation of V on input W and C can be done in polynomial time. I see. Never mind. OK. What was the question? Um, I, so like, I guess I was, I was arguing like without the ax, like without supposing that C, a polynomial time C exists as an axiom, mm -hmm. and then arguing that like if such a C existed that was not polynomial time, then the fact that you can verify W and C in polynomial time means that there must exist a smaller C, which is polynomial time, because V only used a polynomial amount of information about C in the first place. 
and so you just reduce the amount of information and see see polynomial. The premise begins with let NPV let L be an NPV. So it, that is it, true. This exists by yeah. premise. Yeah. Question. There are some like NPV problems that are like optimality, like it's part of like the minimum like like this traveling sales catalog. Okay. C so have to prove that the answer is optimal, or does it show that the answer is valid? So we formulate everything in terms of decision problems because it e it's easier, but there is actually a polynomial search to decision, in fact, a, like a, a very simple search to decision transformation. Suppose you have a, like, let's consider SAT. We'll define SAT next time. But suppose you have a decision algorithm for SAT that runs at polynomial time. If it runs in F of N time, you can actually, it, but it, the algorithm only tells you if it's satisfiable or not. It doesn't tell you what the satisfying assignment is. You can find the satisfying assignment by basically binary searching over that algorithm in N F of N time. So search to decision does this. It doesn't really matter. Usefully, though, when we want to use the language of set theory, we phrase everything in terms of decision problems. So the way a certain language is phrased is like the machine only has to output a yes or a no. Now, the way you find a minimum, you way, the way you translate that into a minimum kind of thing is like you would say that this input is in the language, but then this input is not in the language, right, for some encoding. Like, let's say we're doing clique. We would say, like, GK is in clique. Now, we're, I'm, I'm, not, I'm being wrong about, like, I'm, I shouldn't be using this notation and talking about this because we, we're far out of 3510. We may not remember any of this. But if, like, GK is in clique, then G is a clique of size K. But then if I say GK minus 1 is not in clique, then we know that the smallest such clique in G is of size K. Right? Something like that. Oh, the largest or something, right? Oh. There we go. Okay, right? That'll help us find the largest clique. So optimality minimum can be determined through several, perhaps, decision iterations. So the study of the decision is fine. Do you yeah. get anything like, like the O of n types of event? Um, this is a, let's get into this more elaborate next time when we talk about, well, after break, when we talk about SAT formally. But basically, if someone tells you, like, oh, yeah, that formula is satisfiable or not, what you do is you take that formula, you plug in a 1 or a 0, and you give it back, and they say it's not satisfiable. And then you know the answer was not a zero; it was a one. You can they say, "Oh, now it's still satisfiable." You keep you can binary search over the two to the n space, something like this. It's not too hard. Maybe I'll put it, give it on the homework. It's easy, it's pretty easy. Yeah. Yes. I don't understand how you reduce that to all. Um, like how you show that for all problems, though. Ah, because SAT is NP complete. That's which we'll also have to prove. We're getting a little too ahead of ourselves. Okay. But there's the search to reduction, the search to decision reduction works the same because it works for SAT. SAT is an unelected representative of the entire class of NP, which we'll talk about next time. Uh, so anything that happens to SAT, it turns out it can happen with polynomial cost to other, others. Yeah. Um, right. So any questions on this proof? We've proven that NP was a subset of NPV, and we've proven that NPV is a subset of NP. So therefore, we know that non-deterministic polynomial time is equivalent to deterministically verifiable polynomial time, right? Crazy that this witness gives that much power. I mean, that's all of non-determinism. It's just someone telling you the answer. That's all it is. It's very surprising, I think. Um, Great, we've defined NP. We know very much about the structure of NP. Let's compare it to a complexity class we already know. What's a complexity class we already know? P, all right. Uh, let's prove half of a very hard problem. Why is P a subset of NP? Let's use two definitions. Now that we've shown that NP equals NPV, we're never going to write NPV. We're just going to write NP, and we can like interchange the definitions, okay? Why is P a subset of NP? Let's use both definitions, actually. Let's use the non-determinism definition. Why is P a subset of NP? You can simulate a deterministic Turing machine in a non-deterministic one. Exactly. Same reason every DFA is an NFA. It's the same. Um, why is P a subset of, let's call it NPV? Just, just this one time, one more time. You can compute the solution in polynomial time by computing the answer, and then your witness can be whether your polynomial time answer was yes or no. It's simpler. The polynomial time verifier will simply ignore the witness and solve the problem. So let's say M decides L in poly time. Here's our witness, V on input. Here's our verifier. 
on input w empty string, uh, simulate uh, m on w. Right? I'm going to ignore my auto grader. I'm going to ignore the answer and just resolve the problem. Technically, that is a verifier. The witness is the empty string and QED. Right? Both definitions, we see p is a subset of NP. Right? Now, of course, as we've determined, the, we, we've talked somewhat about the is this a strict containment or not is a very hard problem. So kind of silly that one, showing the containment, I mean, I didn't even finish writing down the words. It's really easy. Showing is the containment is strict or not, very, 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 very difficult problem, right? Career ending of a problem. Um, any questions on those? Let's talk about some more complexity classes and the relationship between them as we, we understand P and NP, right? So unfortunately, because complexity theorists haven't really proved anything, unlike where we say the DFA and the NFA and the regular expression, those are all just regular languages, we unfortunately have a lot of names for things. So there's a, what you could call a complexity zoo of like a thousand little classes, each with a slightly modified definition. Um, let's talk about p-space. P-space, what do you think p-space is? Polynomial space. Polynomial space. The measure of a Turing machine's space is a little tricky to do. You measure time by just counting the steps. Space is actually quite difficult. You basically have to formalize a two-tape Turing machine. The input's on one tape. It can read that one. But you only measure work done on the work tape, on a second external tape. You, decide, you, define, a, you define P space to be the class of problems which Decidable by a Turing machine which uses no more than polynomial amount of work tape, additional space. It can read its input, but it just reads the input. It doesn't write to the input part. It just uses additional space. How much additional space does it use? You know, um, you can actually space is a very weird resource, and we'll talk about space for a whole a whole day uh, later on. But you can define a machine, for example, that loops infinitely but uses constant space. That machine we would say does not have a space bound. The machine still has to halt, right? Loop back and forth, just write, 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 write. That's polynomial space. That's constant space, right? So the machine must halt. What do we think the relationship is between P and P space? Is P and P space, or is P space, P space and P? Which way does it go? P is in P space. Why? Because, well, you just gave an example of a non-halting well, that's not in either, <laughs> technically. Right. But like you could have something that runs for exponential amount of time but only uses two uh, like constant amount of space. But any program that runs polynomial number of steps can only write at maximum polynomial number of times. Yeah. People get this tripped up all the time because they think, oh, if it runs at polynomial time, it also uses polynomial space, which is true. But it's about the languages. So P, language in P, has a polynomial bound machine. That machine also runs in polynomial space. Um, we think this relationship is strict, but it's as hard to prove as p does not equal np, as we'll see in a second. Um, L is a class which is just space log. So what kind of algorithms can you do in logarithmic space? Like what can you do in logarithmic space? Mm. It's not obvious what you can do, but like P allows interesting things like um, dynamic programming, right? Any dynamic programming algorithm can be done in P. Most of the, actually, that's not true at all, but a lot of them can be done in P. If you're in log space, you basically don't have dynamic programming. So the study of what, what is the one thing you can do if you have logarithmic space? Okay, what else can you do? Yeah, let's say that's fine. Binary search, there's some, there's some more things you can do. Sorting? Sorting can be done, uh, well, okay, so let, if you do it in place, you can't do that. You have to copy the input and then sort it. So let's say that takes no. Say no. You can't sort. Let's say that. You can like keep, Basically, what you can do in log space is you can keep 
the counter of a for loop, and that's like it. So anything that does for loops, you can find the min in log space, max in log space, sum in log space. What can't you do? You can't do anything else. I mean, so basically L is like the study, is a better study of constant space than constant spaces, because constant space you literally can't do anything. In fact, we prove constant space is regular. A Turing machine with constant space is regular, right? So L is basically like, it's constant space, but four loops. That's it. Um, EXP, what do you guys think EXP is? Exponential space. Exponential space. It's going to actually be exponential time. Exponential space is going to be exp space. Oh, yeah. I guess that makes sense. Well, it's the convention. You'll learn it. It's not, you don't know it yet, right? This will define as the union of k is equal to 0 to infinity of time of 2 to the n to the k. Now, it's not linear exponent. That's called e, turns out. E is something E is going to be like time 2 to the O of n, something like this. The E does not equal exp. We can prove that, it turns out. Um, they're different. They're slightly different. OK? Um, let me just give you a relationship among a lot of complexity classes, then we'll talk about what they are. We can prove that L is contained within NL. What do you think NL is? Non-deterministically log n of space. Yeah. Now, it, that class is very interesting on its own. We won't talk about it. Um, this is actually contained in P. This is contained in P because you can put a, a complete problem from that non-deterministic logarithmic space. Pathfinding, it turns out, is complete for NL. You can put that in P. Uh, P, we know, is a subset of NP. We don't know if that's strict or not. NP is a subset of, you wouldn't believe this, uh, P space. Why, do we, why would you say NP is a subset of P space? Give me an argument why that's true. Again, that's also deterministic polynomial space. Even using the power of non-determinism, you're only writing like a polynomial amount at the time. Like you're not having like a non-deterministic number of tapes. If that makes sense. So like, does a deterministic simulator of a non-deterministic machine use exponential space? In a BFS mode, maybe. But if you DFS, you can forget a lot of the space. Cool thing about time versus space, time is ever moving. The average lifespan of a human is 78 years. You have like 36,000 months on this earth or weeks. So time is a very valuable resource because once you spend it, you never get it back. But space is not a very valuable resource because after the computation is finished, you always get the space back. You'll never get the time back. So everything in some sense is like, if you count the space at the end of the algorithm, it's always constant space, right? So like what you can do is perform the simulation in such a way that you don't need to, you can re repeatedly reuse space. You like, ex if you DFS the branches, then you pop and you're like, oh, I don't, that was a dead end. You can do that. You, you won't have to write more than a configuration down of the NP machine. And we're like implicitly relying on the fact that we have to halt. And exactly. Break. There is a polynomial depth bound on the computation. Yeah. What is not the number of space that a non-deterministic machine uses? Uh, in NP space. Yeah, so how do you like... So every NP machine does have a space bound, but that would fall under NP space and not P space. P space is deterministic. So like a problem in, is in P space if there's a polynomial space deterministic machine. And P is non-deterministic polynomial time and then non-deterministic polynomial space. I guess I'm just asking like, what does it mean to count the space of a non-deterministic machine? Like do you count like, like you make deterministic choices? Yes. Um, Consider the space, the max space used on the longest branch. It's an upper bound of all the branches then. P space, you won't believe this, is actually equal to NP space. We'll prove this. It'll take like 25 minutes. It's called Savage's theorem. Although we can't prove P versus NP, it turns out if you give, if you study space complexity and you throw in non-determinism, it doesn't do anything. Up to polynomials, it has no effect. Um, NP space is a subset of exp. Why would we think, okay, forget the NP space for a second. Why do we think P space is a subset of exp? Do we have good intuition on that? Here's the thing. NP, P space, exp goes in that order. Why doesn't it go NP, exp, P space? 
Free space is huge, by the way. Yeah? Since there is an exponential algorithm that just writes on every step, and that'll take exponential space. Yeah. Now, does that solve a problem that can't be solved more efficiently? I don't know. But that sounds plausible. Right. Um, OK. XP space, you're not going to believe this, is contained in, let's guess. Guess a class name. X, 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 close. Next, non-deterministic exponential space, exponential time. Non-deterministic exponential time is com contained in, you won't believe this, exponential space. By the way, there are problems that are in exponential space that we can prove are in exponential space. Equivalence of regular, regular expressions with squaring requires exponential space. Chess requires exponential time. We can prove these problems to be intractable. Exponential space is contained in, you won't believe this, next space space, next exponential space, next non-deterministic exponential space. They're not equal. They're... Oh, I don't know. When I say I don't know, I'm, by the way, I mean like both I don't know as a person and we don't know as a community. I don't think, um, no, exponential space should be equal to non-deterministic exponential space by padding argument from P space to NP space. Yes. Exponential space is equal to non-deterministic exponential space. 85% odds on that one. So, um, right, that's a lot of classes. And we don't have this in computability theory because most of them we show to be equal. NP, it's plausible that NP is equal to P space is equal to X. And then that a lot of the nuance is lost. I mean, we can relate many problems that have nothing to do with each other. But this is like uh, com doing complexity theory is, is writing capital letter classes all the time. Um, Let's focus on the following chains. L is a subset of P, is a subset of NP, which is a subset of P space. Do we agree with this? And in each situation, like each class is only placing a restriction on time or space. And one implies the other, or doesn't in some situations. Depends. Depends. There's non-determinism thrown in there as well, and other things. I see. But like, but like, there's none of these classes that are like polynomial space and polynomial time. But like, oh, correct. Absolutely. Polynomial space imply, or like polynomial time implies polynomial space. There is a so, class called right. time and space, which is polynomial time and space. Which is equivalent to polynomial time. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yes. What's like the if you had to draw circles about like what most people agree to be like equal, like what would you say like most people just say are equal? We don't know. There's not even conjecture. Well, they're called different things for now, so at least we don't think they're equal enough to be called the same thing. Provably so. I would guess p space equals x. Maybe I'd put like eighty percent odds on that. I would. I don't think np equals p space equals x. Let's, let me show you a relationship between the classes. We agree on the following this chain of four classes. Do we agree? L is a space complexity class. P space is a space complexity class. But it contains a polynomial, a time class, and a non-deterministic time class Okay, in the chain. When the classes have different resource, we don't really have any tools to compare them. That's when complexity theory gets hard. But actually, if the classes are the same resource, we have hierarchy theorems. We can actually prove unconditionally that L does not equal P space. We can prove that more space is more power. We can even prove how much space is more power, asymptotically. We know asymptotically more space or more time, time hierarchy theorems, give you more power because this is the same resource. We can actually diagonalize to prove this. We'll prove this. L does not equal P space. We can prove that via diagonalization. Yes? That means that one of these uh, subsets is strict. Exactly. Might not know where. Exactly. So. Here's a way to prove uh, P does not equal NP. Let's suppose you prove that L is equal to P. Plausible, OK? It basically, if L equals P, dynamic programming doesn't work. We don't care about it. That's what L equals P says. Maybe it's plausible. I don't know. Uh, if you can prove L is equal to P, and you can prove that NP is equal to P space, as you said, that implies what? P is strictly uh, less than NP, or a subset of NP. Yeah, I'll write it as P does not equal NP. 
So you can prove p does not equal np without even touching the problem. If you can prove a space complexity problem and a space complexity problem, you can actually prove a problem that has nothing to do with space. This is a time complexity class. This is a time complexity class. A space complexity relationship would show something about time complexity. So the space complexity theorems uh, implicate the time complexity ones, right? In fact, there are several other chains you could do with that to prove p is not equal to np. Um, here's another one. Uh, we can prove that p is a subset of np, and we can also place np and xp. And we have something called a time hierarchy theorem, which uh, what the as actual asymptotic amount is, it's non-trivial to derive. We'll prove the time hierarchy theorem. It'll take us a whole lecture. But we can actually prove unconditionally that p does not equal xp. We can place certain problems in xp that are not in p. In fact, actually, we can place chess in exponential time. Chess is an exponential time problem, provably so. Um, like, by chess as a decision variant, I mean given an encoding of a board, determine who is winning, white or black. That is a problem that's in exponential time. We can prove that. But actually, we don't think it's an NP. Because how do you convince someone someone is winning? There's no easy short certificate to say, yeah, this is the proof that white is winning. Here's the movie makes or something, right? You would have to explain that there's no other possibility that black is winning. So that's, we can't prove that, because that would prove NP is not equal to XP, but we think that to be true. Is such an answer even guaranteed to exist for any arbitrary chess configuration? It, the, the witness would be exponential size. Uh, is there a position where both players are tied in chess? Yeah. Put only two kings on opposing corners. I see. Because like that, 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 would, that would imply that like at the onset of the game, when white has not moved, there is a strategy that white can adopt such that it would always win the game no matter what happens. I think heuristically, white does have a small advantage. But like non-heuristically. Like um, I don't think that uh, there is, I don't think chess is fixed. I, I think that maybe he is 51 to 49 odds, but black can never be eliminated. Black can, maybe black always has a strategy to draw, even 51 to 49. Gotcha. Um, include, assuming white plays perfectly, Black can get lead to a draw, is my opinion. I don't have any evidence on that. But anyway, P does not equal XP. We can prove it. I, I'm considering giving it a homework problem. I'm considering giving it in class. I'm not sure yet. But you can do it, OK? More time is more power. I mean, that should be like, duh. But what does that imply? If you can prove that NP is equal to XP, that implies that P does not equal NP. Because again, the left and the right chain. One of them must be equal. If you can prove that NP does not equal XP, as in proving chess is a problem in XP, is not efficiently verifiable, that's enough for you to prove, in fact, that P equals NP. So we just described a problem in chess, like, can you efficiently verify this? If you can prove you can't efficiently verify this, you prove P does not equal NP. Yeah? Does that prove that P equals NP? Couldn't it be that P doesn't equal NP and NP doesn't equal XP? Yeah, you're right. Okay. It, it was the contrapositive of that. Would be, yeah. yeah. Um, right. NP equals XP as open problem, as hard of a problem as P is equal to P, right? Basically, most problems in complexity theory are unsolved because you might accidentally solve P equals NP. There's too many conditions on it, right? Again, we haven't even talked about algorithms. We haven't talked about class. We've only talked about relationship between classes. No exponential lower bound on a, on a NP complete problem. Just straight up, like, set theory, you know? Um, so P versus NP, fascinating, weird, difficult problem, OK? So questions on this one, on the chain? Let's talk about NP and co-NP. Recall that we called, like, uh, L is a recognizable language, TM, uh, if and only if L complement was in uh, the, rec the co-recognizable languages. Uh, Right? So it's not a complement of the class, but a complement of the elements, which are, the, which are themselves set. So we have NP 
So we say L is in NP, L is in co-NP, if the complement of L can be efficiently verified in NP. Co-NP is as interesting of a class as NP is. Um, again, the picture looks something like this. We think it's true that P is a strict subset of NP. Again, just evidence in favor, no proofs. We also think NP is contained within co-NP. Why is P contained in both NP and co-NP? Not necessarily equal, but why is P a subset of both? It's a polynomial time algorithm to like firmly decide yes and no. This is a simpler answer. What is the intersection of NP and co-NP? Like set theory, theory-wise. What should the intersection of NP, co-NP be? As, the, as this co-operation is defined, what is the intersection supposed to be? That both L and L complement are in MP? Yes. And if L and L complement are in P, then they're both in NP as well? Yes. Um, I'll word this as NP intersect co-NP is a subset of NP co-NP, which is closed under complement, right? It's a language which is polytime verifiable, but also its complement is polytime verifiable. We'll give an example of that in a second. But P is closed under complement, and P is a subset of NP. So the complement of the languages in P should be the complement should be in co NP. If P is a subset of NP, then P complement is co P, excuse me, is a subset of co NP. But co P is P, UED, right? So in fact, we know that P is situated between these two. We don't know if NP equals co NP. Um, co NP is in some sense the yin yang of NP. It's like the opposite. If a problem is efficiently verifiable, it means it's in co NP. The complement of a problem being in NP means it's in co NP means like, um, for example, SAT, let me use this as another example. SAT is in NP because you can give a polytime verifier. If there exists an answer, the machine will verify. While NP is characterized by this existential statement, co-NP is characterized by a universal statement. Okay? For all assignments, like, so SAT is NP complete. We have a problem called tautologies to be co-NP complete. A problem is a tautology basically if every assignment of it is satisfying. So the truth table is just all ones. You can't give a verifier for it or a witness for it. But basically, the machine, it's not that if there exists a verifier, it accepts. But for all solutions, they all accept, every single one. You can verify the complement of a co-NP language, but that's exactly an NP language, right? You can verify if something's not a tautology. I can prove to you it's not a tautology. Here's an input that'll make it a zero. How do you prove to someone it's a tautology? I don't know. Um, now, are there things in here? Uh, maybe composites. Composites is in NP. You can prove to someone a number is composite. How? What's the witness for a composite number? It's factorization. Just factor the number. Say, here's a factor of it. The verifier can determine if the factor divides into it in polytime, GCD or something. And there you go. The complement of composites is primes, right? So we thought for a long time that both primes so primes being, excuse me, composites being in NP means primes is in co-NP. But someone was able to prove in the 70s that primes was actually in NP. They were able to put primes here and um, composites, which is just the complement of NP, right? Complement of primes. So this stood for a very long time as the, as the example which we don't believe is in P but is an NP intersect co NP. So which is probably why we don't think NP intersect co NP is equal to P or not. And then in like 2004, there's three guys in India, the AKS, Agarwal, I don't remember, AKS04. Basically, they gave a polytime algorithm, the first in like three millennia, polytime algorithm for determining if a number is prime or not. Huge result, huge result. We've had like 
heuristic poly time efficient algorithms for primality testing. Rabin Miller is one. You may know of others, but those use randomness, right? And they're actually conditional on things like uh, the Riemann hypothesis or something weird, okay? Um, they work well in practice. It, but randomized algorithms is not in the scope of P. P is a deterministic class, no randomization allowed. They were able to give, basically apply de-randomization procedures to a, determinist, to a randomized algorithm. They gave a less efficient but deterministic algorithm for primality. So actually, this is no longer an example because we moved it into P. So we've, we're running out of examples in this one. There are some really hard ones like, uh, uh, like uh, if a stochastic game has an equilibrium or something like this, and then like linear programming. The duality theorem of linear programming puts it in LP and puts it in NP and co NP for a complicated reason. There are a few th examples that are there that are hard to describe. Um, but we can't prove that these are in NP. Excuse me. These are in NP and co NP unconditionally because we gave verifiers and verifiers for the complement. We have no idea how to prove them in P or not, right? Also an open question. This is the same structure that we had as the recognizable and co recognizable languages, but we don't know anything about this structure. We just kind of have a loose. Uh, we don't know if anything is strict or equal, unlike the recognizable and the citable languages. Right? Why NP corresponds to the recognizable languages is a sort of difficult proof, but P definitely corresponds to the citable languages. So it's basically like an intuitive restriction of the, the questions of computability theory. We just don't know how to solve them. Right? NP, co-NP, fascinating stuff. We'll, we'll, we'll delve more into it later. This is just sort of an introductory lecture. Questions? Excellent. You guys have a great 4th uh, of July. <laughs>